So, hey there, space enthusiasts. How are you guys? I hope you all are doing well. And thank you so much for tuning with us. And if you all are active and you can hear us well, just write boom in the chat section if you all are excited. And the moment we get the first response, we will we shall begin with our live session. So I want to see all your enthusiasms. So just write boom in the chat section and we will begin with the things. Today we are going to discuss about new trends in satellite communication. And our guest for the day is uh, Devya Shankar. She is project manager and space systems engineer at Spectral. And uh, today we'll be discussing a lot about uh, satellite communications, its future and et cetera. So you guys can definitely post your queries and concerns in the comment section. And in between, we'll pick a few of them to start with. So let's, okay, we have got the response. So let's begin with this. So thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. And uh, I hope you are you are excited. I'm. I think it's an evening at your side. And uh, so you know, let us uh, begin with understanding how is your day, how is your journey uh, in the space industry, and tell us about uh, your current company, Spectral. Hi, Shivam. Firstly, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be one among the panel of judges for the Space Science Challenge. Um, so yeah. As you said, I'm currently working as a project manager and space systems engineer at Spectral uh, in Singapore. Uh, so I am from Bangalore in India. So I did my bachelor's in electronics and communication engineering uh, in Nitin Meenakshi Institute of Technology. Uh, so it's the space journey, as I can say, it started from there. I um, worked in a project called Stutsat. It was India's first a uh, completely student built pico satellite uh, which i was part of uh, which was launched in uh, july 2010 so it's almost like a decade and a year more yeah yeah it's almost like 11 years we celebrated 10 years uh, anniversary last year so yeah um, and then um, so i did my bachelor's there and we worked on the project i worked as a research assistant where we worked on a follow-up mission uh, called Stutsat 2. Uh, so I was part of the core team member uh, developing the preliminary design for the satellite. And then I also got to work with Dhruva Space. Uh, I think most of you already know about Dhruva Space right now. Yeah. Uh, so I was there for like a few years, worked with a few people. Um, and then I moved on to do my master's uh, in space science and technology in Moscow. Uh, at Skolko Institute of Technology. And I was also a visiting student at MIT in the USA. I got to work on a couple of uh, satellite missions there. Uh, I got to take part in uh, NASA QQuest Challenge, where we tried to build a 6U CubeSat to Moon. Uh, and then I was part of a project called Node, Nano Satellite Optical Downlink Experiment. Um, yeah, like I was working in uh, Star Lab at MIT. And then I also got to do uh, uh, started stratospherical ballooning experiments uh, in both Moscow and in India, India with Dhruva Space and in Moscow. Yeah, in that peak winter, uh, cold winter, I got to do these uh, ballooning experiments. Uh, and then I worked uh, with a company called Sputniks uh, in Moscow for almost like three years and a university called Rudin. So yeah, I was in Moscow for like a couple of years. Uh, and then I moved to Spectral like in Singapore in 2019. And I've been working with them uh, for one and a half years now. So at Spectral, Spectral is a deep tech company uh, where we are building space-based quantum key distribution technologies. Uh, basically, uh, uh, maybe I'll just give you a brief uh, idea about what it is. So right now, currently, we have all these encryption, right? We are in the digital era. Uh, and having the data secure is something that we all want. Uh, but currently, today, we have encryption methods, which are actually built on solving the mathematical problems. Uh, so to break these codes, currently, it's OK. The, we have all these modern computers right now uh, is like good they cannot really break these uh, encryption keys uh, just like that it takes like some uh, years for the modern computers to break but this will not be the case when we have the quantum computers so we are trying to be prepared when we have these quantum computers in place where the uh, today's encryption will no longer uh, work 
So we are coming with the quantum cryptography based solution to have our data safe. So this is something what we are trying to do with the satellites uh, so that we can have the intercontinental ranges covering all over the world uh, with a safe, secure communication. So that's what uh, Spectral is aiming to do. And that's really awesome. Like, um, you know, means people are still thinking about uh, bringing quantum computers and uh, dealing with that. And here you guys are one step ahead and <laughs> actually working on uh, quantum encryption. And I feel that that's, that's really in, uh, interesting means working on, uh, I think, uh, a technology which is far ahead right now uh, from what people are thinking and uh, building the foundation for that. So is Spectral the only company right now working on this or uh, do you have competitors right now? No, we, we do have competitors. So you can see how people are thinking so ahead of the technologies. Like, so we have a couple of them who are, are like competitors. Yeah. Uh, but but as demonstration wise, um, so China is like currently leading the QKD. Uh, they have demonstrated in like bigger, larger satellite. But Spectral uh, is a spin out company of National University of Singapore. So NUS have all has already like demonstrated this QKD in a uh, satellite called Spooky One. So after China, we can say Singapore and Spectral with CQ, CQT, it's called Center for Quantum Technologies, is kind of leading the race. But yeah, there are many competitors in the market. Awesome. And uh, like as you are a space systems engineer at Spectral, so tell us more about your role uh, and your day uh, at Spectral. Like how does it look like? Oh, yes, sure. Um, so I've been working as space systems engineer like almost like a decade now in various different projects and missions and uh, yeah so at spectral or like i think uh, in any way uh, space systems engineers role is to actually look at the big picture so we do the mission analysis like we do the mission planning and execution be part of the subsystems development uh, and make sure the interfaces of all the subsystems are in the right place, uh, do the verification validation. So right from the requirements, uh, like where with the mission objectives to the end where we verify and validate the entire system, we, we have a role. We work with the specialists in different subsystems, for example, uh, as you know, in the satellite, we'll have different subsystems, right? So we have a communication system, we have navigation, we have like power system, uh, like all the systems, like the structural system, mechanical, thermal. So we try to coordinate with everyone and check we get the right design and also the design right. So we try to check the every aspect of the satellite mission. Awesome. So and basically... You, yeah. you they are like the one who coordinates between uh, all the teams and make sure that the overall mission is uh, going in the right direction. Yes. Yeah. Technically, also manage really. So technically, as I said, we'll do all the analysis, the simulations, uh, like the orbit stuff, like everything that is required. Yeah. So something like that. Awesome. And, you know, like uh, understanding uh, more about, uh, you know, your job as a uh, space systems engineer and your journey. Uh, one thing which comes into our mind is like, as you were discuss, you know, we kept the topic as satellite communication. So what are the current modes of satellite communications and uh, what should we expect in the coming future? Okay, so talking about satellite communications, so traditionally we've always been using and even today we are using RF, that's the radio frequency communication. Um, and there is something called uh, optical, the free space optical communication, which people are actually looking into. So these are the two main modes, as you can say, like modes, uh, which are actually working on different uh, electromagnetic wave bands. So basically both my are uh, uh, like radio frequency bands and the optical bands that we are talking about they come under electromagnetic waves right so the radio waves are like towards the lower frequency bands and the optical waves are towards the higher frequency where we have this visible infrared and ultraviolet these are the bands which comes in the uh, higher frequency mode so what happens in the uh, rf band is like 
all the electromagnetic waves when we are trying to communicate it uh, go, undergoes like reflection refraction diffraction all of these which you have learned in like physics right mm-hmm. for the radio frequencies the radio waves uh, these have higher diffraction like the beam spreading is more and you that's why we have like higher coverage in the rf but as you go to towards the higher frequency this gets lower and lower so there's like pros and cons on both the ends like both the rf and the optical uh, but there's like requirements uh, as we are trying to use as we all know communication is a crucial thing in the satellite mission right if we lose the communication we we'll lose the satellite itself there's like no satellite uh, so having said so it also depends on the applications that we are looking at so especially like now you see the earth observation satellites or the remote sensing satellites they they are going for higher resolution images so these high resolution this is just an example so high resolution images have like so much data that is collected and it wants to dump to the satellite with really high data rate so there is a requirement of this higher data rate higher bandwidth the communication requirements based on different applications so that's why there's this fso or the free space optical communication is a solution for many of these so as we can say it's more like uh, so as we can say it's more like the future of the satellite communication lies in the laser con but if we can successfully like you know uh mitigate all the problems the laser com is currently having so there are a lot of uh, experiments demonstrations technological demonstrations that is being carried out uh in the laser com domain uh and i think yeah the near future it's going to be laser com but also on the rf side when you see there is something called uh, as i said they were looking at the lower frequency band so we have these frequency band like uhf vhf uh all these different frequency bands where we can split these electromagnetic spectrum into so they are looking at like ka band ku band which was not really explored so much earlier so the last 10 years it has been the like the focus is on ka band ku band and on these high throughput satellites that we can say so these are uh so it's going on so there's like advantages and disadvantages in both uh yeah i would say the future is more on the laser com and uh, you know as, as you mentioned about laser uh, com and all those stuff so recently i was going through uh, you know various missions of nasa like uh, what they are i i, I think you might be uh, if i'm not wrong it's a boxy uh, mission or something which tested uh, the deep space uh, network technology or something like that in 2008 I'm not oh wrong. yeah there are actually like uh, a lot of sa- like such optical demonstrations uh-huh. that have been done like from the moon to earth from leo to leo leo to brown uh, geostationary to leo like all the different combinations have been like explored mm-hmm. and the thing is uh, it works if we want to replace rf do we have enough uh, technological advancements mm-hmm. in the laser com that we can just replace rf with the laser com that, that that's the thing that we are trying so it works when i want to do the demonstration one time two times it just works so the main challenge here is the cloud cover so when we talk about laser com it cannot penetrate through clouds the rf doesn't have atmospheric interferences to it Uh, but laser com the biggest challenge is cloud so if i want to replace rf like we cannot mitigate the clouds right like i getting mm-hmm. a cloud free uh, atmosphere is like yeah we cannot predict it we cannot like do anything yeah so this is one of the challenges and uh, you know as you mentioned about the clouds and uh, all those stuff so maybe i think uh, suppose if we are communicating uh, only in space uh if we need to communicate uh, satellites uh with each other in space then maybe you might suggest that uh, laser com would be the best uh compared to uh rf so uh sorry you did you mean like space to space in space yeah or suppose like space to uh, or, uh in in space to space so suppose i'm just guessing that uh, in future we might mm. be uh, you know forming a network uh, of satellites like constellation of satellites which will be communicating with each other 
Yes. So right now there are like all these constellations that are coming up. Uh, I think uh, most of you guys will be knowing like uh, SpaceX is trying to come up with this constellation. Facebook is trying to come up with constellation. Amazon, like every big player in all the other uh, different domains, they want to enter satellite industry coming with especially the constellation of satellites. Um, most of them still ha do have the classical, that's like classical communication as the RF com. Uh, but there's uh, also this inter satellite communication, which they are going for optical because whatever the challenges that I actually said, it's more from for space to ground. But for space to space link, um, I think that's the best. There's like, uh, you can just replace the RF with the inter satellite optical links. Um, the challenge is only the atmosphere because the uh, the the laser link has to pass through atmosphere where the particles interact differently. Okay, so I have two questions here. One is that um, as as we are already talking about laser com and at Spectral, you guys are working uh, you know stuff related to uh, quantum. So I believe uh, maybe quantum communication uh, would it be coming up in future? Uh, one is that, and another is. Uh, as you're talking about the challenges, so like, what are the various challenges uh, faced in uh, satellite communication uh, apart from the one which you mentioned uh, regarding the uh, atmosphere? Yeah, so atmosphere is one of them. Uh, the other thing is latency, I would say. No, sorry. So the latency uh, is one of the most important uh, thing. Like when, for example, we are having a live chat now, and we don't want any, even the millisecond uh, delay, right? So that's something that we all expect. The, uh, the, even if you are switching from today's optical fiber uh, net internet to the satellite internet or something like that, the latency is something that we have to consider because the signal has to go from the ground to the different altitudes, right? Uh, so traditionally, all the communication satellites, if you see, they were all in the geostationary orbits. Uh, that's like 36, almost 35,786 kilometers. So it has to go there and come back. There's some few seconds of delay there. But if you go to LEO, the, the time difference is much lesser. It's like 20 millisecond to 40 millisecond. And if it's geostation, it's almost like 250 or something like that milliseconds. So we don't want that millisecond delay also. Uh, so definitely we'll have to compare which is the best uh, that we can achieve, which orbit, orbit it depends on the latency. Um, what are the other challenges? The atmosphere is definitely bigger, biggest challenge. And then I would say, uh, oh yeah, for the RF, the spectrum allocation. So right now, uh, we use these frequencies, right? So every satellite is assigned a particular frequency to work with. So these frequency assignments, we are, it's already like crowded. So we have so many satellites in the orbit. Uh, these frequency allocations and, and also we'll have to pay for it. So as we go for larger satellites, yeah, so it's getting expensive. But uh, on the laser comm side, these are, the easiest things. There is no regulations, regulatory bodies currently for the laser comm, which is an advantage for exploring uh, the laser bandwidth. Uh, so, yeah. So, the, I think, yeah, I would say what else? Yeah, these are some of the challenges, I think. Yeah. Okay. So, the what challenges uh, do you feel to solve them, uh, you know, like, to overcome them? So, just like for RF, to overcome some of the challenges we came to, laser comp and for maybe some challenges might be faced by laser comp for which we might go for quantum maybe in future so is there any relation no. like that <laughs> no no there's no relation like that quantum is like an extra thing it could be actually for both rf and the laser comp so it's more on the uh you know how to make your communication channel secure so i have mm -hmm. the laser comp you can you can do qkd for both rf uh, channel or like laser channel as well so like for both the ways it's making uh, the more secured communication uh, yeah it, if you talk about like two different modes it's always like rf and laser if you want to do improvements to whatever the existing technology is uh, you can do sub subsystem level developments for example you see in the rf 
uh, I was talking about high throughput satellites, right? So previously, they were going for this flat panel antenna designs. So now they're looking at spot beam antenna designs. So like, you know, where you can use the frequent, something called frequency reuse technology. So that's something that you can do. So it's similarly on the laser comm, I would say, if someone comes up with a solution where the laser can penetrate through the clouds, I think we don't have any, like a big major problem with laser comm. So these are the subsystem level solutions that we can actually uh, try to work on, I would say. Yeah. Understood. Understood. So basically, it's like for uh, we have ex existing modes of communi uh, communications which we are working on, and uh, if, if we want more security, uh, that is yeah. when we need to go for the quantum and stuff. Yes. Understood. So at this point, we are getting some questions uh, from our uh, you know live audience also. So let us take one of them. So sure. Shubhrajit is asking. Uh, recently, I read an article that the Starlink satellites are blocking the vision of astronauts on board the ISS. How to deal with such problems? Yeah. Okay. Actually, that's a big problem. Uh, I think it is more like how strategically we can arrange these satellites. Uh, you know, like all these satellites will not be in one particular orbit. They, these will be in different orbits. Uh, in dif uh, at different inclination and all those stuff so not all the satellites will come like for an if i'm an astronomer so i'm okay vision of astronauts or astronomers i think it's both both have this issue even the on on the ground like the astronomers are also facing this problem where they they it's it's it just interrupted right they can't do stargazing and all those stuff uh one thing yeah I don't know if they've actually come up with some solution uh, to it, but on one way to overcome would be like, yeah, strategically placing these satellites where it will do its job. Like, you know, having these uh, connection networking between all the satellites. That's the reason of having a constellation, right? Um, that's one thing, like strategically placing the satellites so that uh, not all the satellites will come into the same uh, field of view, the cone of window, we say. So from the ground, when I'm looking at, I uh, say the cone of window where the satellite passed through. So I think that's one of the solutions that I can think of. Yeah. And like, uh, what do you feel about? Because I, I think the, the reason they are the problems is because they are reflecting light, right? So yeah. do you think, that, uh, is there any maybe existing material or existing way because of which we can control this reflection, minimize it, something like that? Uh, I think there are some research that is going on on this composite materials where uh, that it can actually block the reflection that is, is happening. Um, yeah, some, there are like some research that is being conducted on it. Awesome. So we hope if that comes soon. So I think most of the like the major concerns which are raised on either SpaceX or such companies are that are uh, because of this because all the astrophotographers will actually you know they will come and uh, they would be like okay man you are doing a great job but this is not what we want. Yes. So I think uh, that would be a great uh, great part. Now like uh, moving for forward with our discussion. Uh, we discussed about uh, various modes of communication. We discussed the challenges and stuff. Uh, one thing which I think uh, not only just me, but everyone would love to know that we do have internet on Earth. We do communicate with each other here. But we are thinking of colonizing Mars. We are thinking of going to moon and stuff like that. Uh, maybe in future we'll explore the deep space. So how is internet going to work in space and what types of satellite are we going to use for that I mean, you know because we will have to make networks out there we don't have optical uh, fibers out there so like uh, what exactly are we going to do yes uh, so it is something that people are looking at like for example nasa they've come up with something called space net uh, where they it's basically yeah how how do we have the internet on ground right so we have different nodes talking to each other like that's the way it transmits and uh, receives and all so on the same when we talk about space so we have rovers we have landers we have orbiters satellites everything so we want it it's more like we have all these as nodes which are talking to each other and forming that network 
So that's one of the ways where we can actually create space internet. Of course, the technology or the equipments and the components that goes into these should be uh, well advanced where it can actually correct the errors that is happening, uh, right? So because it is passing through, as, as I said, like the environment that the signal is passing through will have effects on these signals. Uh, they'll be they have to maintain the signal to noise ratios where it can uh, talk to and also mm -hmm. maintain the latency talk to whichever is in uh, corner of window of that particular node uh, that's how you can actually create uh, the space net so for example you can you know, see the uh, iss currently right you have internet on ISS. So how is it happening? So it just has a, a dish, like basically the antenna, with all your receivers and transmitters and routers, how, how we have the setup uh, like at home, right? So what it does is we have optical fibers to talk to, right? Uh, but it's not the same on ISS. So it actually talks to the satellite. So that's how we call the satellite internet there. Uh, here we don't really, when I'm talking to you, I'm not really talking through the satellite so on the iss these talk to satellite like for example there's tdrs satellite that is tracking and data relay satellite systems of usa uh, so the signal they send the signal from there to the satellite and back from the satellite it goes to the ground stations which are located at different nasa centers and that's how they actually do all these video streaming and they also do you know they can tweet also, they use a kind of like team viewer or something like that, where they get the access to the computers on the mission control stations or the centers, and they can do tweets also, right? So this is happening. And the only way is yeah, connecting all these nodes with some technology, like be it RF or laser comp, you need to connect all these bits. Uh, then, yeah, then it is possible. So, uh, like, as, as you mentioned that we already have the rovers communicating with the satellites and they can act as nodes. So, uh, am I expecting that maybe like more and more, uh, like whatever satellites or rovers we have in space and uh, we would be having some sort of like maybe, uh, what do we, what should we call it? Uh, like, like, let me call it some, some really XYZ some spot. Uh, relay yeah. stations would you like to yeah. so relay stations yeah. where yeah. uh as you mentioned to improve the sound to noise ratio so it's like uh if i want to communicate to some other maybe satellite or rover out there i will have to wait that maybe some other nodes comes in between takes my uh you know a uh, signal and then when it comes near to the uh other part of that part it again relays it back with improved yeah. uh it's something called store and forward what we say uh, so it's uh, exactly how all these, uh, the constellation planning is happening, right? So these constellation, for example, they are in the low Earth orbit. So I'm going to give you an example of the Earth scenario. So I have a ground station, so I can only look some part of the sky, right? So whenever the satellite comes into that part, which I say the cone of window, this I can communicate. But I want, I want the real time continuous coverage to the globe right i want to uh, talk to someone some other person on the other part of the world so how do i do it so what does this satellite do so i send the signal to the satellite this satellite talk to the other satellite which is in the corner window of the other ground station so as quickly as possible so if you can uh, take like the optical link between them as one of the things so with with lesser than millisecond delay, it can actually talk to the other satellite in the other part of the world where it is looking at other region and you establish a communication. It's the same way when you talk about deep space missions. So, of course, there's like the move planetary movement which comes into picture. There's relative rotation of everything around it. So, how can we actually establish communication is having these nodes connected store the data whenever it is uh, finding the other node collect the data store it and whenever it comes in cone of window of the other node transmit it or receive it so this is how uh, it can work awesome yeah. awesome so you know like while uh, you were talking about this and explaining the whole concept uh, right. my mind was actually just visualizing so suppose one day when we colonize mars so yeah. uh, to actually have an interplanetary internet something like that so maybe uh for that we, we need to have some constellations or satellite in a certain orbit which yes. maybe moves right. around the mars and earth 
and they're going with this like it's right, going to be a right. complex orbit <laughs> yeah that's what actually see this is what space and systems engineers do they come up with the mission planning uh, plan these orbits where do you actually place your satellites so do i want a relay station on moon maybe i can put a relay station on moon maybe on the surface of the moon or it could be an, an orbiter right lunar orbiter or lunar satellite uh, the so that's a possibility or put it in we have l1 l2 points uh, around the earth so you have to see which one will have more coverage like like in a year which one will see the other node all the time or like most part of the year so you have to plan and place these uh, relay systems in the particular orbits or put around particular planets for example jupiter is one of the favorites for all these deep deep space missions um like i think mostly for the propulsion system and stuff like that uh, so probably you know you have to strategically place these satellites for these communications yeah i get it and you know at this point uh, one more follow up question which i have like this topic is very much interesting for me so uh, that is uh, as you mentioned about like you know the largest coverage so when we use the rf uh, technology the rf communication uh, it covers a lot of area but the signal gets weakened uh, by the time okay. it reaches whereas yes. when we go to the laser com it is much more efficient but the area is not there no, yes so it's narrow which yeah. one do you prefer if we are having an interplanetary internet between earth and mars yeah it depends like you know it depends on the requirement requirement plays mm-hmm. a major role like for what are you what are you trying to communicate i would always go for a hybrid communication system where i have rf and i have laser like for laser especially if i want to transmit so for example we have a rover on mars it's taking like high definition videos i want to get those videos right i cannot sit and wait like if it is like in what 10 mb per second or 20 mb it takes ages to receive it so we want like really high speed uh, data t- transfer which should happen so that like so laser com can give you gigabits per second of uh, data transmission uh, so that's the thing uh, when i talk about uh, rf of course so as we were telling it should be in the range right when i'm talking to you i should see you otherwise i will not be able to communicate so but the rf can have like look for like a bigger area so which is also needed when we are trying to do these communication i think it's an hybrid that will always win i guess yeah that's yeah. really uh, exciting i i believe like the audience uh the participants of space science challenge you are watching us right now maybe this could be one area which you guys can innovate upon and i would be definitely expecting uh some of the entries on this uh, idea personally like i would be really excited if someone can innovate on this and um let's see like uh, if we can if you guys really succeed and we meet you in grand finale uh, that would be an amazing discussion that uh you know we actually contributed to one of the problems which you guys could work upon so that's something which i'm really excited about yeah so sure. uh moving forward with this uh, ma'am we would love to know like what are your advice with the participants of the space science challenge uh, like what are your expectations what do you uh, advise them okay i would say understand the systems properly like it's uh, the basic the fundamentals are the most important especially like you know when you are entering such challenges you need to know and given the time that you have to build something or come up with a design or so uh, it's important to understand the basics the fundamentals of it and when you're co- trying to look for a solution first understand the problem come up with a problem statement what are you trying to solve what is the issue in that particular choose choose any systems that you want to explore there's like there's i'm telling you there's some challenges in every system you take any system there's something that we can always improve on this uh, the, the, the advancements in those particular technologies are always there so check for the current solutions that are there check for what the near future solutions people are looking at so that's how you actually create your own solution uh, and also try to do try to think out of the box so it's not necessary it's a space project of course it's not necessary has to be 
from some solution from somewhere the space things are right it can also be like something that you are actually doing in every day to day life like you can try to think how can i apply this to space a lot of other technologies like uh, have come like that so the space internet or internet of things that you were talking about it's the same thing right so we are trying to whatever we have on earth we are trying to connect the space components with the internet idea there on the other way we are trying to use satellites to build this internet on ground so this is how you bring the solution from the earth to the space or the solution from the space to the earth so think out of the box come up with the proper problem statement and the objective and uh, define your solution clearly yeah that's that's what i would advise so i feel like that would be a great insight for them and uh, you know why uh, thinking about all that we have got one more uh, question from a live audience so again uh, shivrajit is asking uh, he is like voyager is trying towards the outer region of our solar system what is the limit till which we can communicate with it what is the max distance after which we will lose contact with it ha uh, okay what's the maximum distance after which we will lose contact uh, i'm not really sure because it's doing great even after because it's uh, you know outperforming uh, the objectives outperforming the expectations that people had when they actually built it um so it is already crossing the uh, the solar system and it is definitely doing great the uh, the things that would affect its communication would be the radiation damage that these communication systems are going through from the cosmic rays that's going to happen which is like kind of unknown um so that's something which we cannot say there's like yeah uh, different types of storms cosmic storms and stuff which can damage it depends on how good the uh, the equipments are built and also on the ground terminal actually so the ground station will also play a role uh so we talk to voyager and all with deep space network so we have these 32 meter dishes spread all over across all the other uh, like we have i think we have in canberra in australia we have like everywhere placed on the earth uh so it depends on how long we can actually view the satellite like the antennas can view and get the signals uh, so yeah Uh, i don't have an exact answer for the maximum distance but it will depend on all these uh, aspects of the satellite communication awesome and you know like as uh, we, we are discussing about communication and like moving back to our internet part so uh, like what give us some insights over internet of remote things and like how far we have progressed in that regard like uh, what are its current applications or what we will have in future Oh yeah so internet of things is definitely a hot topic currently in the satellite uh, industry so as we know everyone is trying to have like smart gadgets everywhere smart uh, cars smart vehicles like everything is going to be like smart so when we talk about it we also want to look at the connectivity in the remotest places right so uh, to connect all of these we need to have continuous coverage continuous connection with all the devices at any point of time uh, at any in any part of the world so people are actually coming coming up with this constellation approach especially like you know uh, having a, a satellite backhaul for internet that's one of the things that people are trying to do for connecting internet of things where like satellite will be used as a a uh, node for uh, you know having these systems connected i think that's one of the really good ways to connect the remotest places uh, because we don't have op- uh, the ground terrestrial infrastructure to support these connectivity to those remote areas i think uh, going for satellite will be much cheaper and uh, much better application than going for like building optical fiber infrastructure to those remote places awesome so as you have mentioned that uh, this uh, you know iot satellites or internet of remote things we should talk about so they can help us uh, in reaching out the areas which usually uh, the optical cables are not there maybe the hilly areas 
or yes. uh, stuff like that like, and providing iot in this yeah they're like not just hilly areas like you know where there are no uh, real what what do we say like cities in the countries like for example villages mm-hmm. uh, and remotest places in africa and where people are not really looking at the development phase of those places people are not interested to invest in those places right building the infra- optical mm-hmm. infrastructure takes in a lot of uh, investment and stuff and if there are no users especially like uh, the population is like really less uh, people don't really go for like optical fibers so in these places yeah satellite will play a big role i think starlink has already uh, released like the beta version of their uh, Uh, Starlink internet backhaul, and I think that's great. Actually, that's like really great uh, to look yeah, forward to these satellite in internet. Exactly. So we know the thing, right? So I think more than everyone else in the world, I think we Indians know how good or bad the internet is in different regions of the country. So connecting every place is a challenge, and I think satellites can do. this yeah awesome and you know at this point what uh, we would love to know from you is that there are many enthusiasts who are maybe not from the engineering background who are from uh, some different fields uh, but they are very much interested uh, in satellites and satellite communication so how can one kick start their journey in this field yeah i think i would say start uh, wherever you are uh, there's like always opportunities to work on like you know different projects from wherever you are like as i said we started way back in our bachelors like during our undergraduate degree we started working on the satellite projects like i think i joined the team when i was in first year yeah i was i was just first year into my engineering yeah it it was not that i contributed a lot in the very beginning but you learn right so whatever opportunities you get try to grab it uh, work on it apart from your academics what you do as your research projects or hands on with some other project is the most important bit uh, for the journey and uh, yeah i think just be in the loop like with have a good network i think guys like you are like really creating awareness and like you know trying to bring people around and it's an opportunity for people to connect to such people who are already in the industry i think that's great which we did never did, we we weren't having so i think this is a great thing what you guys are doing and you can have guidance talk to people get some advices and uh, yeah i think that's the way to kick start your journey i would say yeah awesome so i i really like this one where you mentioned about uh, you know usually people say um, whenever we say that uh, you want to pursue that uh, usually they have this response that i have to do and go a masters or maybe pursue uh, another degree and only then we can do that but the part which you mentioned that trying to grab the opportunities are uh, trying to you know maybe attend conferences and from there networking with people i feel yeah. that's much more efficient and yes. at least it gives you a kick start rather yes. than uh, just right. going into a degree yeah 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 that's like really quite so it just helped me so whatever the experience that i had in india actually helped me build my career like you know uh, it it is not like oh you have to go out of the country to actually do things and i think currently india is doing great like with respect to the space sector people are looking at the space sector uh, like as you see so it's supporting privatization so much uh, and the investors are actually funding a lot of startups you've seen like many startups uh, coming up in india who are really doing great job there's like lot especially at right now there's a lot of opportunities for people in india to kick start their space journey it's just that you have to go and knock the doors which are there so there are definitely opportunities yeah you have to like try to do some research talk to people and get into something start doing something i think that's how we right. can right very much and uh, at this point one more question which we have gone uh, from our live audience k harini is that 
does astro informatics play a role in iot and designing the spacecraft sorry uh, astro informatics what, um, sorry what is astro informatics like uh, even i am hearing this term for some minutes informatics uh, in the world of space so they have connected it as astro informatics i i am sorry i don't know astro is was it a company what is uh, yeah i'm sorry uh, I think they are referring to a field, uh, but I think just like we do now, we we have I a see. certain fields and we connect it with uh, whenever it is in space, we connect as to with that. So okay, that's I exactly see. I think what uh, they have done. So maybe basically they are asking, does informatics play a role in IoT and designing the spacecraft? So something like that. Ah, uh, if it is something like that, for example, like the communication technologies, whatever you study in your like you know electronics or like the actual one that you use on ground for like communication between the two computers, communication between like you know uh, all the devices, right? The IoT, like the mobile phones and your computers and all the other smart devices that you're connecting. It's the technology that you're using. It's the same technology which will actually go into the space systems also. you know it's just that they are space qualified like mainly the radiation hardened stuff that's one of the main thing for the communication systems uh, other and the protocols like the communication protocols that you use uh, here it's almost the same we have uh, yeah maybe i should have mentioned about protocol in any of the topics that we discussed but yeah protocol is also one of the important things that uh, you have to consider uh, we have like many standards where everyone tries to build on the same standards and uh, build the systems where they can communicate with each other which is the same thing about all the other informatics systems that we have understood and you know at this point one question which i have for you is that what are your favorite books or movies uh, which inspires you the most and you would like our audience to go through and because like everyone has this one uh, resource which keeps them uh, moving keeps them motivated so what is it for yeah. them okay i can say what made me choose this path uh, that was the beginning for me so uh, the book it was my eighth or ninth english or textbook which had like kalpana chawla's uh, chapter in it so that was the first time i decided i want to do something in actually i wanted to be an astronaut that's how it started and or at least be in space so that's how it started otherwise uh, i watch a lot of sci-fi movies space trek is one of my favorite star trek sorry star trek uh, yeah uh, all these sci-fi movies yeah that that keeps me going um, and i think these days there are a lot of uh, series and these that are coming up which always keeps us motivated and i would say every isro rocket launch keeps me motivated and do a lot of things uh it just gives me goosebumps watching the launch so such things you know everything when you see around a lot of things are happening in space uh, that's enough to mo- be motivated and to you know dream big uh to achieve more in your field awesome and uh, you know like as you mentioned about the movies and stuff and the isro so like have, have you watched mangalyaan and like what's your uh, opinion on that movie like how much did you loved it or whatever uh, any no, opinion I, which you have of course there were a few technical here and there which <laughs> is like uh, is it like uh, yeah but otherwise i think it's a good watch uh you know people who don't know anything can at least get something out of it and it actually helped me to tell people what i do as a systems engineer where i said oh i'll just look after all of those systems like you know i think it's definitely of course it's not completely scientifically or technically right in many things uh but at least some bits you can definitely you know get out of the movie yeah so i would say yeah it was a good watch Awesome, and you know, like before we uh, uh, end our session, one last question which I have for you: that what is the message which you would want to pass on to all the girls and women out there? Because I have interacted with many who are interested in space, but they usually pursue it only as a hobby. But when it comes to career, 
uh, I have seen many like changing, either changing their parts or they are like you know just uh, leaving it after some time. So, what message would you want to pass on to them? And maybe uh, like not just girls, even boys in general who uh, yeah, switches, yeah, I think uh, I would just, say like both girls and boys because uh, yeah, of course we were less, not really like a, a lot less, but uh, we had like decent number of girls in my previous projects or like yeah currently also but of course yeah when you compare the ratio it's always like guys were the uh, more but it did not never it did not stop us like uh, by not doing something what we want uh, and i think things are really changed like it's not the same as you see before like like maybe i don't know 20 years ago all things were things have really improved it's um there's nothing to think in terms of gender uh we have equal opportunities everywhere we are equally uh, you know uh, looked upon in anything that we are uh, working on um, given equal like you know uh, respect or whatever you say i think uh, i don't i've i've not really come across that discrimination in my workplace or in the universities where i study and stuff like that yeah i yeah if there is something people are thinking about and uh, not really exploring that's not right that's what i would say uh, general if dream big when you are dreaming big these things are like you know uh, tiny things which should never come into the play right so yeah just go out yeah dream big start working towards it that's what you have to do So I used to always say, like, dream, desire, and take a step. You have to dream something. You have to really have that passion within you to actually go and do, and you have to work towards it. Just dreaming and having the passion will not really take you anywhere. You have to work towards it. Things will just fall in place. You know, I had a story. I think I'll not talk about it. Like, it takes more time. So yeah. So we all have gone through. There's like ups and downs everywhere, but the doors will always open at the right time. at the right place uh yeah so yeah coming actually as i told when we try to work in dua space as a startup it wasn't the same as you see it right now see like 10 years it took 10 years to see some like right change so things happen so i think we'll have to just work towards what we want that's how it, uh, i would say definitely and it's a it's a great message for everyone to you know actually just uh, start with the stuff and then uh, believe that things will eventually fall into place and not losing the hope so yeah like hope is one thing uh, which everyone yes. must have and i right. believe that keeps us going and at this point i would like to tell all the audience who are still watching us that this whole session was organized to give you guys more insights uh in the field of satellite communications and encourage all of you to participate in the space science challenge which is currently being organized and uh, there is uh, you can apply and participate in the space science challenge till april uh, end then the first round of prelims will begin from may so we are expecting a good number of participation from all of you and if you guys have any queries and concerns you can reach it to, reach out to us and go and visit ssc.spaceover.com for more details and guys do not worry about the challenge do not think it is not made for you you will either learn or you will learn that's it right so go give it a shot and all the best and thank you so much ma'am for joining us today and we are signing off bye bye take care thank guys thank you bye bye